very happy to have Vincent and visiting us today. I think many people here already know Ven from his time interning in the Redmond lab, but uh, if you don't, uh, Ven, is, um, uh, Ven, Ven has done some very interesting uh, work both uh, in theory and uh, empirical in the areas of imitation learning and reinforcement learning. And today he's going to talk to us about some of his results on generalization efficiency in RL. Take right. away, Ven. Oh, thanks, Alec. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Wen from CMU. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about reinforcement learning with a focus on the generalization ability and sample efficiency. All right, so throughout my PhD career, I've been thinking about this problem. How can we design algorithms that have the ability to generalize and is also sample efficient in terms of learning to make complex decisions? All right. To answer this question, I'm going to talk about two approaches today. So the first approach is to leverage extra help. In this talk, it will be expert demonstrations. Right? So I will tell you how can we use expert demonstrations to design algorithms that can efficiently solve sequential decision-making problems, problems that are otherwise are probably very hard for any reinforcement learning algorithm. Okay? For the second part, we're going to focus on the settings where, unfortunately, we do not have any, any extra help. So we are going to look at the problem instance and trying to exploit the structures of those problems in order to design sample efficient algorithms. Right? And what's more, I'm going to tell you a unified story that can capture the complexities of the problem instance from a very large uh, family. Okay. Now, before diving into the details, I just want to quickly point out the difference between supervised learning and sequential decision making. Right? So supervised learning is probably the first thing that we learned in Machine Learning 101. We have a set of training data where each point is ID sampled from some unknown distribution, and we fit as some function approximator. Right? And afterwards, given a new test image, we just make a prediction. So the key here is that this whole process is kind of passive, in a sense that you make a prediction on this test image, it does not going to affect the future image that you're going to see, right? Because after, after all, we're assuming every, every data point is ID sampled from some unknown distribution. Right? In other words, your prediction is not going to affect the data distribution. Right? But this is fundamentally different in sequential decision making. Everything is active here. The, the sequence of the image that you're going to see in this video game is determined by the action you applied, right? If you apply the bad actions, this is the state, uh, the future state that you're going to see forever. If you want to go to state space where you, where you want to collect large rewards, you have to learn to make decisions to get to those state space, right? So in short, everything is active. Your decision affects the future data distribution that you're going to see, right? So, Learning sequential decision making can often be characterized by this reinforcement learning framework, where we have two components, a learning agent and an environment. Where in this agent's mind, he has something called policy, which is denoted by pi in this talk, that maps a state that describes the current environment and that outputs an action. Right? And then they send the action to the environment, and the environment evolves accordingly. It sends back a one-step immediate reward, and it also generates a next state, conditioning on the current state and the action it received. Right? We're going to assume that the transition dynamics here is Markov Markovian transition. Okay? And we're assuming that the dynamics is unknown. So we repeat this process for each many steps, and the goal is to find a policy that maximizes the expected total reward. Right? So in this setup, the environment could be you know, a self-driving car system, where the state is the state of your car and the state of, states of other cars. Right? It could be a human like us, where the agent is some mass tutoring system, for instance, that tries to pick a mass problem for us. And the goal is to maximize our mass performance across the entire semester, for instance. Okay? So more formally, we want to find a policy pi that maximizes the expected total reward across this edge many steps. Right? So in this talk, we're going to focus on finite horizon. But the work that I'm going to describe later uh, can be easily extended to infinite horizon with discount factor. Okay? And I'm going to constantly interchange between reward and a cost because they're roughly the same. You can think about the reward as the negative of the cost. Okay? So reinforcement learning was very popular even 20 years ago. Right? At that time, we used reinforcement learning techniques to solve backgammon. That was the big news at that time. Recently, it became popular again. Two years ago, we sort of solved the Asian board game Go, and we beat human champion in this game. And last year, OpenAI tried to uh, 
be the human champion in terms of playing this video game, uh, Dota, which is very challenging. Uh, um, it looks like, you know, IO is easy, right? Because we uh, sort of solving all these problems. But let's look at into details of these problems. For instance, the OpenAI 5. So OpenAI basically says that they played this game, they trained their agent on hundreds of GPUs, of course, but also on 128K CPUs, right? That seems a lot. And if you assume each CPU is, for instance, 100 bucks, then you can do the quick math, right? This is the bill that you're going to receive. Maybe this kind of money is, is not that much for Microsoft, but I can't imagine what expression my advisor would have if one day he sees something like this, right? <laughs> Um, so I think if you have to spend that much money to just to set up the computers to train this agent for just playing this video game, I don't think the problem is easy, right? I don't think I/O is solved. And if you look into the details of these algorithms, one major component that they're using is some random exploration strategy, right? Which you basically do random trial and error via massive simulation on massive number of CPUs, for instance. Well, it doesn't really mean that the technique on this left-hand side can be directly transferable to real-world applications. For instance, can we duplicate a patient into one million of herself to do random try and error? Can we destroy one million of cars before we learn how to drive? It seems we can't, right? So what we really need for this real-world application is the sample efficiency. Now, speaking of sample efficiency, we have to look at the progress that we have made so far in terms of the, uh, in the, re in the theoretical reinforcement learning community. Right? So we understand how to solve discrete MDPs very well. We have beautiful algorithms for these discrete MDPs. And we know that in order to achieve absolute near optimal policy, we just need to make polynomial number of interactions with this word, with this discrete word. Right? Polynomial with respect to the unique number of states and unique number of actions in the horizon. Right? And these algorithms are very nice. They are mathematically beautiful. But the major issue is that this polynomial dependency on the number of states <coughs> forbids us to transfer what we understood here to real-world application. Right? For instance, for playing Go, we know that the total number of states in this game is larger than the total number of atoms in this universe. So this poly dependency on the number of unique states is just going to kill us. Right? Not even mentioning real-world application, we have continuous state space, and the feature vector is usually high dimension and very complicated. Right? Okay, so what we could do. So again, let's look back at supervised learning. After all, this is something that we understood pretty well in terms of both theory and in practice. Right? So we have a large set of training data. We fit a model on the training data, and then we do prediction. Right? And there is no such thing called polynomial dependency on the number of unique images in the world. Right? So that would be crazy because it means that if we want to make a prediction about this dog, we pretty much have to see all the images of the dog in this world. And we actually can achieve this type of generalization via rich function approximation. All right. So we would like to do the same thing for uh, large-scale MDPs. Specifically, we want to bridge the gap between the left and the right by using rich function approximation technique right? so that we can generalize across the states that we've never seen before. All right. So this is nice, but in worst case, we cannot achieve the generalization that I was just hoping for. So the problem is that for problems like this needle in the haystack, where you have only one reward in one of the particular leaf, and if the agent has no prior knowledge of this problem, the structure of this MDP, the structure of the reward, if it has to start from random, it pretty much has to look at all the passes in order to find the needle in the leaf. Right? So this means in the worst case, the number of interactions you're going to make with, respect, with, the, with the real world is going to scale linearly with respect to the number of states. Right? There's just not that much you could do. OK, so this leads to um, the two things that we're going to talk about. So the first, we're going to talk about how can we leverage expert demonstrations, imitation learning, to efficiently solve problems, including the needle in the haystack problem. That is really hard for reinforcement learning algorithm. Right? 
And then we are going to look at the settings where we do not have expert demonstrations, but how can we exploit the structures of the problem that we are facing and develop sample efficient algorithm for a large set of problems. Okay, so let's talk about expert demonstrations. What I'm gonna show you here is first, why we wanna do imitation learning. Why imitation learning uh, is better than reinforcement learning. Two, how can we reduce the sequential decision making problem into a sequence of supervised learning by leveraging uh, expert demonstrations? Three, I'm gonna talk about how can we generalize from a set of local experts. Okay. So imitation learning, when we talk about imitation learning, we usually have three components. An expert that provides some data, some demonstrations, and you have some machine learning algorithm that takes the data as input and computes some <coughs> policy that maps from state to action and you can deploy this policy uh, during test time, okay? So in this part of the talk, we're going to focus on the setting, which is interactive imitation learning with access to reward signals, right? So the setting is basically we have a global optimal expert that is available during training, um, and we can query for feedback from this expert. One example is a human sitting behind the wheel. It can take over the car whenever the system asks him to, right? So this is the interactive expert that we're talking about. More formally, let's see, we have some uh, learning algorithm, currently learning some policy, and we drive the car using the current learn the policy to some point, and then we ask this interactive expert to take over from this point. And the interactive expert is just gonna drive this car to the end of this episode, and then we're gonna record the expert trajectory's total cost. Right? So you can imagine this total cost is sort of indicating how easy it is to recover a potential mistake that just made by the learner. Okay. So you may wonder what kind of examples are you know, interactive expert? Well, the first example is human sitting behind the wheel, right? That's how now we collect data for training uh, autonomous driving. And the second example that I wanna talk about here is that an expert does not have to be human, right? It could be some algorithm or some software, for instance, a planner or control in some robotics applications. For instance, I wanna train a policy that maps from image from cheap front cameras of a self-driving car to control signals, right? I can train this policy end-to-end -end fashion, but that's probably gonna take me forever to train it. What I could do is that in training time, I probably will be able to buy very expensive sensors. Right? And I can use them to build very accurate state estimator, which allow me to build very complicated but accurate motion planner or optimal control during the training time, which I'm gonna use it as a global expert during training. Right? Of course, such kind of expert is only available during training time because when we ship the cars to the market, we just wanna use the cheap sensors right? so that the customers can afford it. And the second example is that in some natural language processing task, for instance, dependency processing, by using the ground truth labels in the training data and the objective function that we care to optimize, we can sort of build, use search algorithm as the interactive expert. Right? So we will get to this point later. All right, so this is set up. So now, at this point, you may wonder, you have access to objective function, you have access to reward signal, why bother using imitation? Uh, why don't you just use our favorite reinforcement learning algorithm? Right? So intuitively, imitation learning is just much more sample efficient than reinforcement learning. And a good example is high jump. It took top athletes a couple of decades to figure out the correct way to do high jump. But once Dick Fosbury figured out this Fosbury flop, right after one or two years, pretty much everyone converted to this uh, Fosbury flop. Right? So it basically means that imitating is much faster than reinforcement learning, you know, trying to figure out the correct way from scratch. So now let's formalize the advantage. So the first advantage is global optimality. If we assume that the expert that is available during training time is nearly global optimal, then there are algorithms such as aggregate, stands for aggregate with, with values, they can learn a policy such that the, uh, the performance of the learner policy pi hat is close to the performance of the expert. Right? So we avoid local minimum in this case. And the second 
benefit is that we can just learn much faster. Right? So what we can show is that there exists a set of MDPs such that with global optimal expert during training, we can learn near optimal solution using imitation learning algorithm by time scales logarithmically with respect to the number of total states in these MDPs. While for any reinforcement learning algorithm, you have to visit pretty much every state. Right. Now, this logarithmic time is something that we want, right? We want to learn near optimal behavior by just visiting tiny part of the state space. Right, so let me quickly explain how we get this exponential separation. So the idea is that we're just gonna look at this needle in the haystack problem again, right? So it's very simple, deterministic mark of decision process. You have reward only at the leaf node, and the needle is on the leftmost side, all right? Now, without any prior knowledge of the structures of the reward of the dynamics, we're just given the learner an optimal uh, expert, an optimal planner. Yes? So, so are you assuming that you have the reward function? Or yeah. You, you have so access to the reward. You don't have the reward function. You visit a state, you get a reward signal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the environment yeah. gives you. You don't know the structures of the reward. Yeah. yeah. All right? So <coughs> we're assuming we have an optimal planner that during training time, at any state, it will look at the subtree beneath this state and find the path that leads to the leaf that contains the highest reward, okay? Now, with the help of this expert, we can pretty much reduce the sequential decision-making problem into a bunch of sequence of um, supervised learning problem, right? So for instance, at the very beginning, the learner, because the learner knows nothing, it probably picks the worst path, right? At this point, we're just gonna ask the expert at the root. So the expert tells us that you should go left because the needle is on the left subtree, right? So now we just convert the learning problem at the first layer as a supervised learning problem. We have state S0, X0, and we have label left, right? And we do supervised learning, and we can safely eliminate the entire right subtree, including the state that we never visited, right? Now let's see, we update our policy, but we make a mistake again at X1. And we, do, we ask the expert for help again, and the expert tells us that you should go left again, right? And we do supervised learning, learning again, and we eliminate the entire right subtree beneath the state. So basically, every round, we are eliminating half of the remaining nodes, right? Yes? Why does the depth matter? I mean, why can't I have just depth one and all the states? I know the expert just tells me, okay, this is the correct one. You know, to have a gap from S to one, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, why, why does the depth of the tree matter? I don't understand. Like, why can't all the state be at depth one? All the state at depth one? So there's no transition from a state to a state? Yeah, just, uh, I mean, you start you start at zero, and then, you know, you just don't know where to go. Like, you have, is it because you want two actions only? Yeah, or? yeah, he wants to limit the number of actions. I, see. I mean, you can do key actions, but it's a number of actions. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if we have many actions, like here, yeah, okay. I guess it's just trivial is a separation could be from one to S. But I think there'll be a worse dependence on the number of actions that we have access to. Okay. So, so here, uh, basically the, the RL and the IL1 both have the same set of actions. Yes. The number of actions is not growing, it's being held constant. Yes. But the IL solution is going to have logarithmic dependence on S. Yes. In the other case, we need, we need to allow the number of actions to grow with the number of states yes. for that construction. Yes. Why is that the problem? I you have to be a bit careful. Your uh, multi-class classifier might have a poor dependence on number of actions. It can have up to linear dependence on number of actions if you're not careful uh, statistically. But here there is nothing statistical. That's the thing I don't understand. It's all deterministic. There is no... Uh, is this, this, yeah, so this example is deterministic. But you can transfer it to stochastic setting. Right, so you won't get this hobby, but you're just gonna run, for instance, exponential uh, with the majority algorithm. Right, you get logarithmic dependency on the number of states again, but it's not just gonna be. So this is like hobby. We're assuming everything is deterministic, but you can extend it to stochastic setting by running the, the expert algorithm. Yeah. But so the number of actions is finite. And here it's assuming finite, yeah. So we're assuming that the poly dependency on the action is fine, but the poly dependency on the states is not fine. Yes. So why why is your tree balanced? 
just for the purpose of constructing this 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 uh, example for proving the lower bound. <coughs> but your but all of your states could be like you could like you could only have one state on one side. Yeah. So so if 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 it's not balanced, if you have like just a pass, then both the algorithms are going to perform the same. Similar, right? But we're just trying to build a concrete example where you can separate the RL and imitation learning, just for the purpose of building the lower bound for reinforcement learning. All right. Um, so, as I mentioned, one of the algorithms that can achieve this level of efficiency is aggregate. Stands for aggregate aggregate with values. So again, the idea is very simple. We want to convert this problem into supervised learning, right? We're going to use two procedures, law in and law out, to generate a supervised learning sample. So let's see at any time during training, I'm just going to execute my current learner in the real world and stop at some randomly picked time step, generate a state, right? And then I'm going to ask the expert to take over. I will try first action A1, and then I ask the expert to take over. And for instance, in this time, the expert occur cost 100. Right? It's completely out of control. A1 is just a bad action at state, at state X. Right? And I go back, try A2, and the ask, ask the expert to take over again. And this time, we drive very smoothly, uh, mainly in the track, so cost is 0. And then I go back again, try A3, and ask the expert to take over. And this time, for instance, the total cost is 5. So basically, by doing this procedure, I generate a supervised learning sample where the feature vector is state x. And I have three labels here, a1, a2, a3. And each label has its own associated cost. Right? And if I do this, sorry, so in this example, for instance, if I classify it to action a1, it's really bad because its cost is 100. Right? But if I classify it to a3, it may be OK because 5 and it's not a big deal. So if I do this procedure multiple times, I can get a data set that consists of pairs of state and cost vectors, of which the dimension is the number of actions, which is three in this toy example. Right? So this is nothing but a cost-sensitive classification data set, a supervised learning data set. Right? Now, with this supervised learning data set, we can actually train our policies using state-of-art nonlinear function approximation techniques. For instance, we could just start directly parameterizing our policy using very deep neural network, differentiable neural network. And we do this low in, low out procedure multiple times, get a cost-sensitive cost classification data set, and we form a cost-sensitive loss, right? a classification loss. And then you just differentiate this loss function to compute the policy gradient. And once you have the policy gradient, you just close the loop by performing gradient descent, SGD, or stochastic natural gradient descent. The key here is that by converting this problem into supervised learning, by generating supervised learning data sets, we can use rich function approximators to take care of potentially very complicated features. So one of the examples that we did is dependency processing on handwritten algebra equations and solutions. So the input is a algebra equation and its solutions provided by some student. Right? So it's a low pixel image. And we want to output a dependency tree, a pass tree. Okay? Now, dependency parsing has been studied for a while, and people convert this to a um, sequential decision making problem. In fact, researchers in MSR actually did some work on this for dependency parsing for natural language. Right? So we're just going to use the same framework that converts dependency parsing to sequential decision making. But the key challenge here is that we have to deal with this low pixel image, the handwritten algebras written by a student. Right? And what we used here is some LSTM to represent an encoder that scans the character one by one, and the end outputs a feature vector that sort of serves as the summary of the handwritten algebras provided by a student. Right? And afterwards, we're just going to use another decoder to compute the sequence of transitions, which will be used to build this pass tree. Right? So at this point, everything is basically similar to um, dependency processing on natural language. Right? So we compared this approach to the reinforcement learning approach, which uses the reward signal, but it ignores the interactive global optimal expert. Right? 
And we also compared to another imitation learning algorithm, which uses the interactive global optimal expert, but ignores the reward. Right? And then we can show that by leveraging both interactive global optimal expert and the reward signal, we can do much better compared to either of the uh, two baselines. All right, cool. So if we have a global optimal expert, we can use it to achieve sample efficiency in both theory and in practice. But what if we do not have a global optimal expert? Right? So what we're going to do in this part of the talk is to show how can we generalize from local experts. Let me explain what it is. So the motivating example is AlphaGo 0. So for AlphaGo 0, because we are dealing with the game Go, we have fully access to the known and deterministic transition dynamics. Right? And at any point during training, we have two policies. We have a fast reactive policy, often represented by some deep neural network, that can be executed in test time in real time, right? very fast. And we have some very slow policy at the same time, which in this case is a search tree. Right? At every state visited by the reactive policy, I'm just going to grow this tree. And then I'm going to do search in this tree and provide a supervision for training the reactive policy. Right? So in other words, I will never ever train the reactive policy using reinforcement learning techniques. I'm actually training this reactive policy by treating this slow policy as the expert and train it using supervised learning. Right? This is actually the key that different, different difference between this AlphaGo 0 and the older version of AlphaGo. Right? And I won't point it out here is that by no means that this search tree is a global optimal expert, right? As I mentioned, the total number of states in this game is larger than the total number of atoms in the universe. So this tree just explores a tiny part of the state space around the states that previously exploded by this faster reactive policy, the global policy. Right? But nevertheless, this local expert provides useful information to supervise training this fast reactive policy. Now, this alpha zero leverages the transition dynamics to build the local experts. But when we talk about reinforcement learning, in general, we do not have any prior knowledge about the transition dynamics. Right? So how can we do this? Yes? Um, why is it enough to just know the dynamics and not the reward function? I mean, I'm, oh, they, 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 they mean the reward function. Right. So are you also generally thinking about settings where you yeah. have both? Um, you, you, know, you, know, you know reward function. Okay. Yeah. Right, so um, we can learn the model on the fly. So what I'm going to show later is that we're going to spend minimal effort learning the model that just for the purpose of building local experts. Right, right. So this leads us to the framework called dual policy duration, where the idea is simple. Every time during training, I'm going to maintain two policies: a fast reactive global policy and maybe some complicated slow local experts. Right. So let's see. As some iteration n, I have my current learned policy. A global policy, for instance, represented by some deep neural network. I'm going to execute in the real world, generate some trajectories. And I'm going to extract a bunch of state action next state triples from the generated trajectories. And I'm going to use supervised learning techniques to fit a estimation that estimates a transition model, right? That takes state action as input, predicts the next state. Right? And I want to point out that this learned model is just a local model, right? Because we are fitting this model on the data that generated from the current global policy, right? And with this model available, now we can apply local planning or local control. What we do is that we use this learned local model to expand the search space around this red trajectory, the state that was previously explored by the current global policy, right? So once we explore the space a little bit using the learned model, we can do search or planning on, um, for instance, on this tree. Okay? And once we have this local control, we're going to use black box imitation learning algorithm to update the parameters of our global policy so that the behavior will get closer to the local experts. Okay? And then we close the loop. Hopefully, we improve the performance. We can show that in my assumptions, this process guarantees monotonic conversion, monotonic improvement, and gets to convergence. It's about the notion of locality you have in mind here. Like, are yeah. you thinking about locality in the policy space in terms of distributions yeah. induced, or yeah? So, so what we did is in terms of distribution induced. So, what uh, you policies. do, yeah. Okay. So, what you do is that 
you take this learner model as input and the reward function as input, you're trying to ask the optimal control to compute a policy. But you're going to subject to a, a trust region constraint. Okay. Yeah. And is the, are you assuming deterministic dynamics here? No. It's actually stochastic. So when you were saying you, you're predicting the next state, how can you then predict the next state? I mean, if it's a distribution. Oh, you just predict a distribution. For instance, you're using yeah. Gaussian oh. Oh. Yeah, which we'll, I will talk about in the next slide. Right. So, as I mentioned, this is a very general framework. You can plug in any supervised learning techniques to fit the model. You can use any black box optimal control. You can use any black box imitation learning algorithm, right? So the first instance that I'm showing here is that <coughs> we use a bunch of Bayesian linear regressors to fit time-dependent dynamics, and we use iterative linear quadratic regulator as the black box optimal control, and we use aggravated with natural gradient update as the black box imitation learner. And we tested it on helicopter funnel. So I'm just demonstrating the behavior of the learner policy on this helicopter simulator, right? So it learns the policy how to do this helicopter funnel, which is flying this helicopter in a circle. And in the second video, I'm showing you the trace of the center of mass. So after five iterations, it doesn't know what's, what's going on. But roughly after 10 iterations, it kind of learned what's going on. And after 15 iterations, it pretty much can do this motion. And comparing to popular deep RIO methods, we can show that in log scale, we can actually learn much faster than, for instance, this baseline. Right? And then what about comparing to more classic but provably efficient RIO algorithms, such as conservative policy iteration? So we did experiment on synthetic discrete MDPs, which are generated randomly. And we use another special instance derived from the dual policy iteration framework, where we use maximum likelihood to estimate the model. We use value iteration to, uh, as the optimal control. And again, we use aggregate, aggravated as the black box imitation learner. And again, we can show that in log scale, it can significantly outperform uh, conservative policy iteration. Right. OK, so we have talked, yes. I'm trying to place this in the landscape where there's also a bunch of these papers looking at self-imitation as another approach where the, the, the most basic one I know of is where you don't try to learn these dynamics models. You just, based on all the rollouts you've collected, just try to imitate the best performing ones. So you mean uh, trying a bunch of random actions and... Uh... Not a, like basically, if you have your current global policy, just generate a bunch of rollouts under that. Yeah. Uh, look at the subset of the rollouts that seem to have got you good rewards, and try to imitate just the subset. So this is very similar to, for instance, the tree search, right? Yeah. It's just that you're just using shooting algorithm to generate a bunch of uh, actions. And basically, I, I'm trying to like understand what are the trade-offs between those classes of approaches, which are also invoking an imitation learning style oracle, but yeah. without having to learn a forward dynamics model, basically. I feel like if you're, doing, if you're dealing with a long horizon problem, if you don't learn the model, right, if you're just using shooting algorithm to generate a sequence of actions and repeat that process you know, 500 or 1,000 times and pick the best one, it is asymptotic, but the chance that you get a good sequence of actions is, is very small. Right? It's, it's exponentially lower when your horizon getting bigger. Right, but if you can learn a model, you are basically leaving the search procedure to a black box optimal control. Subject to how good the learn model is. Yeah. Might also be better in the stochastic dynamics case. The no, like learning the dynamics model becomes much, much harder because now I need to learn to get the distribution over the next state slide. But imitating the trajectory is also pretty for us. Yeah, interesting. All right. <clears throat> so for the first part, we talked about how we leverage expert demonstrations to quickly solve problems that are potentially hard for any reinforcement in the algorithm. Right. So now, um, Let's talk about the second part, where we do not have any extra help. So what we're going to do is look at the problem instance and trying to exploit the structures of these problems in order to design sample efficient algorithm. Right? 
What I'm going to tell you later is a unified story that can capture a large number of uh, problem instance. And specifically, first, I want to tell you why we want to exploit the structures. In other words, why we want to do model-based RL. Right? Two, I'm going to just going to introduce you this unified measure that captures the complexities of a lot of special problems previously studied in the literature. Right? So first of all, what is model-based RL versus model-free RL? So this boils down to the effort of modeling dynamics. The first example is the example where we know the, we, we know the dynamics perfectly, right? We have a perfect simulation simulates the world. Yes? Is that a good question? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Uh, we were muted, sorry. Hey, Wayne, I have a question. Um, why do you call this expert demonstration? Because you don't actually have an expert. You just know the reward function. It's really like basically reinforcement learning settings. Yes, it is reinforcement learning setting, but uh, you still need the expert to roll out, right? But the expert is just a control algorithm. Yes, it is a control algorithm, yes. Oh, you mean in the second part, yes. So we're just trying to... Right, so we're just basically treating this control as the expert. So in some sense, this expert is not... It's not like, for instance, a human expert. Right, so you're not assuming more about... You're not assumptions to make the problem easier. It's just, it's just a different style of algorithm. It is just different style of algorithm. Yeah, but the planning step and the control step is probably very computation expensive. I see. Okay, cool. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, so in, in, the, in the very early part of the talk, you were talking about, uh, expert, about optimal experts, globally optimal experts. And then the second part, you were focusing on locally optimal experts, right? So where does the... What do you use this distinction in the, in your algorithm? Like, why basically does it matter for the expert to be globally optimal in the first? Uh, I think the guarantee of the second part is just much, much, much weaker than the first one. So okay, so it's basically hidden, hidden in the proofs yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I was actually wondering, could you comment a little bit on what exactly can you guarantee in the second? <coughs> so the guarantee that you can get is pretty much the whatever the approximated policy duration type of algorithm can guarantee you. So you, you, you sort of guarantee just the local optimality. And if you're lucky, if you have good initial state distribution, then you may be fine. Right, so basically, the bound is scales by a, a, a ratio oh, that's see, between see, see. the state distribution you induced and the optimal policy state distribution times the like the delta. Delta is the policy improvement from the imitation learning and the uh, optimal control. Nice. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay, so the first example, we know perfect model and we can do planning and control just in the simulation, right? There's no, we don't need any real world samples. The second example is that in unstructured environment, we probably don't know the exact model. Right? It's really hard for us to write down the differential equation for this car you know, drifting and jumping when driving in high speed on this rough, tough terrain. But we, what we could do is using data-driven approach to learn a model that predicts the real-world transition model. Right? And then we can do planning and control. So this is model-based RL. The third approach is that I don't know the model, but I don't even bother to learn it. Right? I'm just going to directly predict the behavior by doing random trial and error. So this is model free. So in this part of the talk, we're going to focus on model-based RL. Right? So in terms of setup, we have the real-world transition, denoted as P star here. For instance, this captures the real-world transition of my car. Right? Now, because it's unknown, so I need to use function approximators to approximate it. So we are assuming that we are given a set of function approximators, right? each function approximator trying to approximate this P star that takes state action as input and outputs a conditional distribution over the next state. All right? And we're assuming that this function class is rich enough to capture the true real-world transition. Okay? And we're assuming that we have an optimal planner that takes an arbitrary model, transition model, as input, and the reward function as input, outputs a policy that optimizes the reward function subject to the given model. All right? So this is nothing but just a planning or control step. 
And planning is very hard, but as I mentioned before, we often in practice have very efficient and accurate motion planners. And I emphasize that this step does not require real world samples, right? Everything is done in simulation because the model is given. Now, why we want to do model based RL? There is a long debate in terms of model based versus model free, right? Ranging from very old methods such as iterative learning control from 1980s to more recent works such as guided policy search or the dual policy iteration framework that I just mentioned before. Practical wisdom seems indicating that model-based algorithm is often more efficient, sometimes probably exponential, exponentially more efficient than model-free. Right? Now this is cool, but what about in theory? Can we do any claim? Can we claim anything in theory? So this is um, what we showed in the summer is that there exists a set of Markov decision process, including common ones such as factored MDPs, such that in order to learn near optimal behavior, model-based algorithm going to spend time polynomially with respect to all the relevant parameters. But any model-free algorithm has to spend time scales exponentially with respect to the horizon of the problem. Right? So to the best of our knowledge, this is the first exponential se separation in sample complexity for model-based versus model-free. Right? To me, this theorem basically motivates me to further study model-based I.O. algorithm. Right? And in fact, in the literature, people actually spend a lot of time studying efficient model-based algorithm for um, different problems. But the effort were kind of independent in a sense that we design specific algorithm for a specific problem. We design algorithm for factored MDP, for instance, which is often used to model something like data center cooling system. But the algorithm that we designed for factored MDP does not directly transferable to, for instance, a linear quadratic regulation system, and vice versa. So can we build a unified story? Can we come up with a unified algorithm that can simultaneously achieve, that can achieve sample efficiency for all these problems, including the problems that are not shown in this picture? So this is what I'm going to tell you now. So before we dive into the details, I would just want to quickly introduce one statistical tool that we're going to use, which is a tool used to distinguish two distributions. Right? Imagine I have two distributions, P and Q. P is a distribution, for instance, models the real world bedroom image. And Q is a distribution, for instance, you come up in order to approximate the real world distribution. Right? the imaginary samples from your model, the imaginary bedroom samples. And now, there's some technique called integral probability metric that basically takes these two sets of samples as input and outputs a number that tells us how far these two distribution is. Right? Basically, it uses a set of discriminators, a function that maps from image to real number, and look at these two samples and it tells us the number that captures the divergence between these two distributions. Right? So you can, you can sort of intuitively think about this discriminator as a classifier that looks at an image and tells us how real it is. Right? And this is a very general divergence in a sense that if we, if we design specific discriminators, we recover very common divergence. For instance, if, if all the discriminators are functions with bounded values, then we recover total variation distance. If all the discriminators are functions with bounded Lipschitz constant, then we recover Wasserstein distance. Right? So in short, this is a very general divergence that looks at two sets of samples from two distributions and outputs a number telling you how far they are with each other. Okay? Now, with this two in mind, we can actually do these cool things. How can we distinguish a candidate transition dynamics from the real world transitions? Right? Now, Let's assume that we have a set of samples represented by the green dots, a set of states. I will tell you how we generate them in the next slide. But let's assume we have this set of states available. Now for each state, I'm going to apply a random action. And then I'm going to generate an imaginary sample from my candidate transition. And at the same time, I'm going to generate a real world sample from the real world transition. Okay? So now I'm going to do the same thing for all these green dots. Now I get two set sets of samples. The first set of samples is the imaginary samples, generated from my transition dynamics. And the second, set of the second set of samples are the real-world samples, generated from the real-world transition. 
Now you probably can imagine what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do the integral probability metric, right? I'm going to assign a set of discre discriminators to look at the set of two sets of samples, and it computes a number telling me how real the generated transitions from my candidate transition is, right? So here, you can think about the discriminators. At, yes? Was it the same action being done on each of these green bars? Oh, random. No, you just every randomly generate sample. Every, every time you randomly generate okay. the action. Okay. So basically, you can think about discriminator here as a classifier that looks at transition, state, action, next, state, triple, and it tell you how real it is, right? And we call this number model misfit, in a sense that if this number is small, it means that from the discriminator's perspective, the transition generated from your candidate model looks very real, right? So in other words, it means that your candidate model is likely going to be the real world model, right? So with this in mind, now I'm ready to introduce the concept the, the unified measure that captures the complexity of a lot of special problems. So let's look at this matrix, which we call the misfit matrix, of which the size is the number of models times number of models. Right? It could be really big, but let's just look at one particular entry that is indexed by this lower model PR and the column model PC. Right? So we're going to use the lower model to generate a bunch of state actions, the green dots that I showed in the previous slides. Right? And now we're going to condition on the green dots, and we're going to distinguish the candidate model from the real world model. Again, using the set of discriminators, right? And we call this number, uh, this number is basically the misfit of the column model. Right? And the, the, the model rank is defined as the rank of this misfit matrix. So intuitively, if we have low rank, it means that the models in my model class kind of look similar. Right? All right, so as I said, this is a giant matrix, right? If your model class has an infinite number of models, this matrix has an infinite size. How could it be that the rank is small? Right? Okay, so in fact, for a lot of interesting cases, the rank is actually very small. For instance, for Lipschitz continuous Markov decision process, where the transition dynamics is Lipschitz continuous, we can show that the rank is no larger than the covering number of the underlying state space. And for factored MDP, which is often used to model the data center cooling system, we can show the rank is no larger than the exponential with respect to the in degree of the underlying network. Right? In this example, the in degree or out degree is two because this particular server is only going to affect the two servers, the two nearest servers around it, right? And for palm DPs, the rank is no larger than the number of hidden states, which means that we can apply it to a setting where we have very rich observation space, right? Such as low pixel image. And for continuous control, such as linear quadratic regulator, we can show that the rank is no larger than quadratic with respect to the state vector dimension. So in all these cases, yes? The, the earlier separation that you mentioned between uh, model-free versus model-based, yeah. does that apply to POM DPs? I thought that it was very specific to the MDP formulation, right? Yes, that is specific for... Yes, that is specific for MDP cases. Okay. Uh, it's specific, specifically the lower bound is constructed from uh, this factor MDP. Right. There are also other examples where we can show that the rank is small. Right. So with this rank, we can actually design a very unified algorithm that works for all these settings, achieve sample efficiency for all these problems. And I'm not going to dive into the details of the algorithm, but we can show that we can achieve sample complexity that looks like this, where everything is polynomial with respect to the relevant parameters, including quadratic dependency on the rank. And the key here is that there is no such polynomial dependency on the unique number of states in this problem. Right? This is exactly the supervised learning type of generalization that we want. We want to achieve near optimal behavior without brute falsely visiting every possible state in the world. Right? Cool. Right, so this um, summarizes this part of the talk. So, so far we talked about how we leverage expert demonstrations. Yes? You lost me. So did you have a constructive algorithm that achieves this sample yeah. complexity? So yeah. does the algorithm need to know R? 
Yes or no? No means that you can just run the doubling trick to guess the R, right? Uh, and just pay a little bit more in terms of log. Yeah. But you're never, gonna you're never gonna build that giant matrix in a computer rank, right? But you just guess, like, that you're using the doubling schedule to guess the rank. All right, so in the second part, we talk about how we leverage the structures of the problem to design sample efficient algorithm. And specifically, we build a unified measure to capture the complexities of the problems from a large family. Right. So now for future work, I'm interested in extending reinforcement learning to or applying reinforcement learning algorithms to real world applications such as medical treatment, designing personalized education system, or robotics tasks such as autonomous driving or robotics assistance in disaster recovery. Now, these kind of tasks are quite different from the video games or the simulation that we're currently using in the deep reinforcement learning community. Right? For these kind of applications, we have a sense of urgency. In a sense that we do not have that much time and loom to do random trial and error before we can propose something useful. Right? So again, for these tasks, we need to care about sample efficiency. So as I mentioned before, leveraging expert demonstrations is a good way to, to get a significant improvement in sample efficiency in both theory and in practice. So I would like to continue work on this in future, especially to reduce the assumptions on the expert. So we mentioned imit interactive imitation learning, but as you probably noticed, we have to put a lot of burdens on the interactive expert. Imagine the expert is a human, he pretty much have to pay attention during the training time because the learner is going to ask for feedback at any time during training. Right. So what I want to do here is that to reduce the burden on the expert, probably all the way to the setting where we can just learn from watching. Right. The dream of lowball learning, I wanted this Atlas Humanoid lowball to do backflip by just watching how Bruce Lee did it. Right. But this means there will be no interaction because unfortunately Bruce Lee is not here anymore. Two, there is no expert action. I don't think Bruce Lee can figure out how much torque he applied on his, his joints, right, to do backflip. There will be no reward signal, because human, we can just do it very naturally. And we just kind of call this setting as imitation learning from observation, because we are just asking the learner to observe the expert perform some task. Right? Now, we recently looked into this setting, from a theoretical perspective, yes. But also, I mean, the setting is uh, the observations that the agent is going to be getting are not the same sensory inputs that the that the, the demonstrator has. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. It's a different. I, I don't know what it's called, but basically, it's a, yeah. it's a different action space and probably a different state space too. Yeah. 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 So we recently looked into this, but from a much simplified setting where the learner and the expert are operating in the same world, in the same MDP, for instance. And we designed some algorithm called adversarial imitation, adversarial, forward adversarial imitation learning. In short, unfortunately, it stands for fail. Um, <laughs> but the, the general idea is that we want to learn a sequence of policies forward in time. right? And here I'm demonstrating a set of expert trajectories, where the ellipsoid represents the state distribution of the expert at a particular time step. And start from the initial distribution, I'm just going to learn the first policy such that the resulting state distribution match to the expert state distribution in terms of minimizing the integral probability metric. Right? Then I'm going to freeze the first one, learn the second, then freeze the first two, learn the third, and all the way to the end. And we can show that we can apply this to large-scale MDP and achieve the supervised learning type of generalization that we want, meaning achieve near-optimal behavior without brute force state visiting all the possible states in the world. Even though it's called a fail, but it kind of worked well in practice. So we applied it on some robotics simulation task where without any prior knowledge of the task, without any prior knowledge of the robots, and without any prior knowledge of the physics of the world, by just learning from watching the expert, we can learn policies such as move this manipulator around to chasing the changing goal, or move the manipulator around to push the object to a set of diverse goals. What really motivates me here is the potential applications of this method or this setting. Right? Wouldn't it be really cool if we could put a robot in the kitchen and let it watch the chief do amazing stuff and learn how to do cook? Right? 
Well, of course, there are a lot of challenges because as you can see from the left to right, there's a big gap, right? So the first thing that interests me is that how can we maybe boost the imitation learning algorithm by first initializing using videos? After all, we have so many videos uploaded to YouTube pretty much every second, right? Videos are probably recorded from different people, from different houses, from different angles. How can we figure out a common pattern that we can use, can be used for um, the downstream imitation learning algorithm? And the second challenge is that how can we interact with the expert? When we're imitating a human, sometimes it's really hard, especially for today's robot. It would be really cool if we could figure out a way to interact with the expert, ask him, for instance, can you teach more gently or can you teach more slowly? Right? And the second direction that I would like to explore is how can we do extremely fast learning from prior experience? For tasks like medical treatment, or robotics assistance in disaster recovery, there is just not that much time and loom for us to do try random and error, right? We have to figure out something. We have to propose something very fast. And maybe I'm super biased, but I don't think there exists a single reinforcement learning algorithm without any prior knowledge could achieve that level of sample efficiency for the task at, that, at this level of complexity. Right? But for us human, we sometimes can do very well on a relatively new task, right, without that much random try and error. It's mainly because we have seen a lot of prior knowledge or prior experience about solving similar tasks. So I would like to do the same thing for reinforcement learning. For instance, given a new problem, I would like to build a memory store that stores all the prior experience about solving maybe similar tasks so that I can quickly query the relevant prior experience for solving today's task. Right? And at the same time, I want to do consistently refine my memory store using the latest experience that I have in terms of solving this new task. I wanted this data structure, this memory store, to be efficient in a sense that I wanted the search and refinement to be very fast. Right? One example, toy example, is that maybe one day I taught this human eye robot to do, you know, right leg jump forward, a couple of months ago, it learned how to do backward, or maybe 10 years ago, it learned how to do forward already. But today, I saw this robot, I asked it to stand up with no training, no field of training, for instance, right? Now, if we have such kind of system, the robot can quickly look at his memory store and figure out relevant prior experience, experience that relevant to doing similar locomotion tasks, right? And maybe we can do completely offline learning from the prior relevant experience so that we do not need any fresh samples to solve this standing up task. So in summary, we talked about how we leverage imitation learning to quickly solve reinforcement learning problems. And we also talked about how we can exploit the structures of the problems to design sample efficient algorithms if we do not have any extra help. Right? We also briefly mentioned how can we design a memory store so that we can do extremely fast learning from prior knowledge in an offline learning fashion. In the early years of my PhD, I also worked on something that could be useful for solving reinforcement learning tasks. For instance, uh, I worked on policy evaluation, where the goal is to sort of figure out the performance of policy before even you deploy it on the real world system. This is very important for safety critical application because you need to get a good sense of the quality of the policy before you deploy it. I also worked on system identification, where the goal is to figure out a model such that you can do state estimation. For instance, we use it to estimate the height of a drone or estimating the weight of an object that is currently being transported by a robotics manipulator. We use it to estimate the velocity and the positions of our microparticles by just using the sensor readings from microscopes, for instance. System ID is extremely important because pretty much for every problem in this big circle, we have to get a good state estimation so that we can use it for the downstream reinforcement learning algorithm. Right? So in summary, I'm excited about combining all these pieces together to bring reinforcement learning closer to real world application. Um, that's it, thank you. There's some kind of questions. Yeah, you talk about you use IPM to quantify the sample complexity, but in IPM, we need to choose the F, the discriminator function class. In your application, how, in your analysis, how you choose this F? 
Um, yeah, so in general, you can choose this f as long as you satisfy some realizability assumption that we define in the paper in the sense that your, your discriminator class, of course, it should be rich enough. It should be rich enough to capture the optimal value function of your model class. So you have a model class, you have a bunch of models, and then for each model, it has its own optimal value function. Right? So we're assuming that the discriminator class is rich enough to contain the optimal value function of each model in your model class. So in fact, you have some relation between these discriminators and the value functions. Yeah. So in some sense, the value function is a very good test function to witness the difference between your model. Right? You don't really need something that is more richer than that, I think. <coughs> yeah, I think this kind of thing is interesting because as you said, if your function class is too small, then you do not have yeah. much power, but if your function class is too large, then it will kill your sample complexity again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's not entirely true. You can construct a more complicated algorithm which has no dependency on the richness <coughs> of the discriminator class and sample complexity. But the algorithm is kind of ugly and not very, uh, I don't think it's really ever like that can be realizable. Yeah, I think in fact theoretical need it will be a problem because at least mm -hmm. in scan. Not, not, not in our case. Remember, we have the ability to choose the model, right? In some sense, we are comparing two distributions. One distribution is a real world distribution. We do not have access to the likelihood. But we actually have the likelihood to, we have actually have access to the likelihood of the distribution that we picked, right? This is different from GAN. Yes? In medical domains, it seems very important that you could guarantee that the policy will behave safely in certain situations. Um, would yeah. you have thoughts on how we might move towards a safe or guaranteeable RL? <clears throat> so I think that for that part, I think policy evaluation is extremely important. So in some sense, before I deploy this policy, for instance, I tested it on the real world, I should have a good sense of the uh, performance of this policy. Um, <clears throat> so in none of this stuff that I talked about, we, we didn't consider a safety constraint. Um, but I think it would be really cool if you could somehow integrate the safety constraint into this reinforcement learning algorithm, especially when you do exploration. Because exploration is kind of, you know, contradict to sort of safety, right? Because you want to explore, you want to make a mistake in order to learn. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, if you try to do um, imitation learning from observations by having the, the agent, by feeding the video stream to the agent, for yeah. instance, or quite a task, it's sooner or later you'll run into the situation where there's something that's crucial for accomplishing the task that's missing from the video. And uh, for instance, you know, you watch a chef cook something, right? Well, they'll set the temperature in the oven to some value, but they'll be sort of blocking, right. the, blocking the view of the oven, and, and the agent, I mean, there is nothing the agent can do, right? But I was wondering, is there anything about your algorithms that will at least allow recognizing the situations, that the agent is missing uh, critical, critical features? Uh, not, not in the current setup. Uh, I think if you have some information within, um, without any other prior knowledge, it's just hard, right? So in imitation learning, there is in general. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that this this problem does not necessarily have to occur in settings where you are just trying to I mean, teach the agent by having them watch the video, but. Even in more standard mutation learning settings, you can run into this issue because the sensors of the agent are very different from the sensors of the human yeah. who's doing the, yeah. the expert doing the task. So in, in imitation learning, there is in general no good way of detecting some situations where uh, <coughs> the agent is missing <coughs> crucial features. Um, I'm not aware of this kind of situation. At least the, the, the task that I looked into um, pretty much the expert and the learner, they operate in the same environment. Yeah. And, yeah. So the, the learning from watching stuff is, is definitely very, uh, it's, it's still 
like I still just started looking into this. This I have no idea so far. I don't have a good answer to how to deal with partial sort of missing information in the essay. Yes. My my question just tags on to that one. I, I was just going back to the first part of the talk where you established this gap between imitation yeah. learning and RL and yeah. saying imitation can get you supervised learning like guarantees. Yeah. Uh, I was actually like very stunned when you claimed that the fail algorithm can also get those supervised kinds of guarantees because I was thinking of exactly this failure case. Like like if, if there's even a little bit of partial observability, yeah. like, do we even know that imitation learning is a good algorithm to use or is something like RL better? So then you probably have to somehow leverage the rewards here, right? Or the, or the description of the task to do some, to achieve something at least. Otherwise you can just, you cannot just do learning by just watching, right? right? Without, with like critical information being missing. Right. Um, right. But it could be, you could combine whatever the partial information or partial observation you have and the reward signal, if you have access to the reward signal together to learn something. This is basically the issue of unobserved confounding, right? Like, yeah. So I can just flip a bit in the unobserved part, then the demonstrator is like sort of giving the optimal policy, assuming that flipped bit is one, mm -hmm. where the agent has to act in a world where that flipped bit is zero. So this is unobserved confounding. Like all the demonstrations I've collected can't give me any information about the actual world that I'm in right now. It's, I, it's almost like I can construct these kinds of degenerate examples where imitation learning cannot give me supervised learning like guarantees. Like, I will need to act in this world. Right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. But the, the supervised result that I showed is a, is a much simplified setting. It's in a sense, MDP yeah. Setting. yeah. It's a much, it's an MDP. And you just, you have a set of demonstrations that consists of the states that visited by the expert. Right? There's no like partial information or whatever is, is there. Yes. In the direction of using memory to leverage prior experience, is there some existing work that you see as promising? Um, so I think people start looking into leverage memory to solve a, <coughs> for instance, supervised learning problem, including some work that I did with John. But I haven't seen the result on the reinforcement learning setting. Or, um, or there are some memories, memory related, memory augmented reinforcement learning algorithms, but they are not like sort of lifelong. In a sense that they try, for instance, they're trying to solve this maze problem. They just build the memory for this particular maze. And when you go to the next maze, you're just gonna erase the whole memory and do it again. In some sense, the memory is only alive for this particular problem. But we wanna sort of the memory continuously grow. Right, I want to store the memory for this maze, the memory for that maze, and for every maze that I visited. If I see a, a maze that is, looks similar to the previous maze that I visited, I can quickly extract the relevant experience. Right? So I sort of want to build a lifelong memory, rather than a memory, a short-term memory, that is only going to use for, for this particular episode. Um, yeah. What do those architectures like DNC and those neural Turing machines? And yeah, so they basically um, it's they basically maintains a matrix, right? Um, it's a fixed size, and every time you pretty much have to scan every row of the matrix to extract the useful information, and then we insert something, you have to scan all the rows as well. This memory store you're thinking of is like dynamic and growing with the number yeah. of tasks that you're yeah. interacting. Yeah, and I also want to do search and refinement as fast as possible. I don't want to spend linear time on this, right? Because when your memory is getting bigger and the bigger linear time is just going to kill you. And also, I don't want to pre-assume the metric, right? So those 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 structures you mentioned, they assume that the Euclidean distance as the underlying metric, for instance. Some of them. All right. I think we should turn it around and take most of your uh, further time for questions.